Right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Psalms. Psalms 46. Psalms 46. And we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Psalms 46. In the very first verse, the Bible says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will I not fear, though the earth be moved, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake and the swelling thereof selah. There is a river, the streams thereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered His voice, and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations He had made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. See you. Amen. Dear Lord, we thank You, we praise You for Your Word this morning. Lord, we thank You how it speaks to us. Lord, how we can learn Your character and learn Your ways from the Word that You've left for us. Lord, we praise You for that. Lord God, this morning we may we pray that You might allow us to see You as the only hope, as our refuge in the day that we live. And Lord, we be faithful to give You the praise, the glory, and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, we'll be preaching this morning about living in the refuge. Uh, I dare say that most of us do not spend our time here, or the, the majority of us spend our time outside the refuge. And when you're outside the refuge, you're at risk. You're at risk to be hurt. You're at risk uh, to be compromised. And, and I've seen in the last 25 years a lot of individuals compromised and a lot of whole churches compromised because they won't abide in the refuge. They won't stay where there's safety of God. Now, uh, first of all, I want you to see this is a psalm of Korah. It is not David's psalm. He did not write it. It came from his chief musician. And if you'll follow the psalms, uh, there's a number of different writers. Some are not credited to anybody. But there are a number credited to Korah. And Korah understood the character of God. Now, if anything can come out of this life, if you live here 20, 30, 80 years is understanding just a little bit of who God is. Uh, of what He's about and what He does and His character. And if you'll read the writings of Korah, I really believe that he did have some good understanding about the nature of our God. And so he begins writing, God is our refuge. He is the one where it abides. Now they understood this because they were Jews. And I want you to go very quickly back with me to Numbers, Numbers chapter 35, and I'll read why they understood this so well. Uh, Numbers 35, and we're going to begin reading in verse 6. Um, Numbers 35, and beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, the Bible says, And among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities for refuge. Now, first of all, I want you to see the people who ran the city were the Levitical priests, and they were the ones that were sponsored, if you will, that their, uh, their living was made in the works of God. And in those Levitical cities... Uh, uh, some of them had to be had to be donated or marked as a city of refuge. Now, this morning there is a refuge, and his name is Christ. 
There is a refuge that you can flee to in any given situation, and that refuge is Christ. Now, to, to seek that out, the very first thing you have to know is that you're at risk and that you're in trouble, and most of us don't have enough spiritual sense to know that. And I, I'm talking about the redeemed. The lost, of course, they don't know because they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And it's impossible for them to know. So these Levitical cities, six of them had to be no, do, uh, noted or donated or earmarked for refuge cities. The rest of verse 6 says, Which ye shall appoint for the manslayer, that he may flee thither, and to them you shall add forty and two cities, six from each one. Now, I want you to see that the individuals that were to go there were individuals that had accidentally killed somebody. Now, under the Levitical law, you know what? It's not like it is now. Uh, our judicial system are supposed to take care of crime, but in the days of the Jews, just say, for example, that I accidentally uh, killed uh, Jared's sister. He had the right to come and kill me back. And, and there would nothing whatsoever uh, be said to him because it was a legitimate thing to do. Now, uh, in our day, that's, you know, but what I found with our failed justice system is this, is nobody ever gets what they're supposed to. That, that is the problem. Now, this individual that was convicted of the crime, if he was quick enough and ran fast enough, if he got to that city, he was safe. If he could get there before some of the family got to him, he would be okay. It was a city of refuge. Now, uh, you know, that, that had to be a sight to see, and that had to be a wonderful thing to aspire to, is to see that city of refuge and know that you were almost there. And that once you got there, the risk would be gone. Now, let me tell you this. Every one of you, you are at risk. First of all, every one of us are murderers. If nothing else, you, you inherited your sin from Adam and you're dead already. You know who killed yourself? You did. Our sin is what... There's no spiritual life in us. And so every one of us are at least guilty of that. And what you need is a sanctuary city. What you need is this, uh, is this refuge that the writer tells us about. And that is where we to go. A place of safety. A place of goodness. A place where no one will bother us anymore. And the good thing about that is there we can grow. You know what? Uh, I'll say this. The reason no one grows today is they're not in the refuge. Now, right down here below us, five miles south here at Bear Spring, there is a wildlife refuge. In that, and I think there's about 12,000 acres there, in that place, you can kill nothing intentionally but the fish. That's the only thing. It's never open to hunting. The deer can't be hunted there. The duck can't be hunted there. There's nothing in that place that can be hunted. It is a refuge. Now, unlike land between the lakes, uh, there are seasons that are open there and you can go. Unlike the river that passed through Dover, you'll find duck blinds all along there. You'll find them uh, in the soybean fields in the wintertime. And you're fair game there, but in the refuge, nothing can harm you. So why would we not spend our time in the refuge? And I'll tell you the reason is why is because of our flesh. Uh, the world is enticing, is it not? I mean, really, is it not? Is it not something that, that appeals to you? Something that, that, that gives you, uh, uh, that, 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 that piques your interest, so to speak? Of course it does, because that's what we're made of made out of. Now go back to our Psalms and, and, and Psalms uh, 46 and uh, I'm going to continue reading there just for a minute. Psalms 46 um, He says, God is our refuge they knew what that was and strength and a very present help in trouble. So He's the refuge He's the place to go for safety and then He says 
He's my strength. Now, you know, I have a lot of people tell me this, and they're right on when they say it. I'm just not strong enough to do that. You're absolutely right. You have no strength in yourself. Uh, Brother Larry, I just can't live that way. I don't have the strength to do it. Yes, you're right, you don't. But your strength in Christ is great sufficiency there. So he says, I'm your refuge and I'm, I'm your strength. So the next time that you think you can't handle it anymore, remember you're not... Uh, you know what? Where we get in trouble is when we start relying on our own strength. That, that, that's when problems began to come on the scene. But if you're relying on Christ and what He's already done, listen, you're okay, you're good to go. And, and so we find then uh, that we way too often rely on something else. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Now, everybody likes this psalm. I, I, you know, what I do in my Bible, I do this. Every time that I hear a sermon on something, I make a little mark in that text. And what I found, that Bible is almost eight years old. And I found everybody's sugar daddy. You know. But the Bible says this, it's the full counsel of God. And uh, so this psalm has been preached on six times. I'm the sixth, and I don't count my own, that's just stuff I hear on it. And so this is the sixth time, and you know what? Because it talks of the sufficiency of, God, uh, of Christ, but what is often left out is he says, you know, I am your refuge, I am your strength in a time of trouble. You know, just as, just as much as it guarantees I'm your refuge, it guarantees troubles on the way. There's not one child of God that's lived without trouble. Not even one. And, and, and I'll say that by this. It, it, the reason that we receive trouble is to, re to strengthen us in Christ. And, and so he says, I'm your help in trouble. Verse 2, Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed. Now, you, you get that as the psalmist is saying, even when there's no longer an earth here, I'm still going to be alright. I'm not going to be... You know, uh, uh, you know why I'm not fearful of the day of judgment? You know why that doesn't bother me? It's because I'm depending on Christ. He's my, he, he is my solstice. He, he, he is my payment. So why would I fear? And so as Korah is writing here, he says, I don't even fear in the day of judgment. I don't even fear the fact that one day when this earth is gone, that God is still sufficient, that God is still present, that He's still there doing the exact thing He's supposed to be. And though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, you know what? That very thing is going to happen. Uh, it, it, it's going to be just that way. If you saw a mountain fall over into the sea, you know, everybody be so tore up. Now, some of you older ones will remember this. I think me and Donna was about 12 or 10 when Mount St. Helene blew over in, it was in Washington State, I think. And, uh, and you know, everybody's all tore up and you can see it for miles. You know what? It may blow again. And you know what? It may be the New Madrid fog over here just in, oh, literally runs through West Tennessee. You know what? It may fire again. If it does, our God is sufficient. Why, 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 why do we get so tore up? What I preached on last week. Because you have no faith. Right? Well, why, why, why do we get why do we get antsy? It's because it, it it is something anything that threatens this flesh bothers us. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake and the swelling thereof seal up. Now uh, that that word of praise I want you to see comes after listing the judgment of God. Saying, man, the earthquake came and there's nothing left of Memphis, Tennessee. Blessed be the name of the Lord. There's not a one of us in here that would say that. But that's what the psalmist is saying. 
See, the only time we really rejoice is when the flesh is preserved. But think about David. David, the Bible says, is a man after God's own heart. What did he do when Bathsheba's baby died? Went, cleaned himself up, went down to the house of God. Perfect example of how we are to handle these things. One, uh, once, once his life was gone, he no longer knew that prayer would, and uh, he could no longer intercede in prayer. Then he began to praise God. That's what this writer is saying. Verse 4 There is a river, the streams thereof shall uh, make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. Now I want you to see that speaking of Jerusalem and speaking of Israel, he says God's with her and she shall not be moved. And you say, well, why was there no Israel for some 2,000 years? It wasn't God's problem, it was Israel's problem. See, when God withdraws Himself, it's over. He says, as long as I'm with you, as long as I'm in the midst of her, everything's going to be fine. See, really, that is what your, uh, your security hinges on, is it not? It, it, it doesn't have anything to do with you. It do not even have anything to do with what you believe. It depends on God. Right? And, and so we as the Lord's people need to understand that, that our God is always sufficient even in these times of trouble. Praise Him in the good, praise Him in the bad. Verse 6, the heathen raged, and boy they will. They'll make fun of us. Listen, uh, the, the heathen in our own country have about went crazy the last few months with our president doing some of the stuff that he has. And you know what? This may be bad, but I think it's pretty funny myself. Uh, let them scream, let them shout, because you know what? Uh, he's doing what the Lord, you know, even if he's a lost man, could be, just like Pharaoh, he's doing exactly what he was invented to do. Mm -hmm. And he's accomplishing it. And, and so, you know what? Let the heathen rage, and, and they're going to call you call you bigot, and they're going to call uh, you all sorts of names, and that you're filled with hate, and on and on. Let the heathen rage. The heathen rage, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, and the earth melted. Just one little uttered voice, one little, the earth goes away. The Lord, is, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. See that. So he says, when all this is happening, everything, catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe, I want you to know that God is your refuge. Now, why is it then that we don't flee to it? Because we love the world. Why, when there's trouble on the scene, uh, uh, you know, you're a little short of breath, and you know, maybe coughing a little something up, first time you run to the doctor, right? The doctor is not your refuge. God is your refuge. And the reason why we do that, that's how we've been trained, is it not? We've been trained to use God, to use Christ as your last resort, as your ace in the hole. Why not use Him first as your refuge? Why, why, why not... Why not uh, seek Him out in the very first. Why not look to Him in the beginning and rather as a last-ditch effort? Verse 8, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations He had made in the earth. You know, uh, uh, that, that's a wonderful thing is to start noticing where God's judgment has been. Now, a few times, I think it was last year, when I went out to Idaho to preach, it took me back to Phoenix. And as we were going south from Idaho to Phoenix, there were miles and miles and miles of desert. I, would, I, I was looking out of the window of the plane, and just miles and miles, I mean, just unbelievable. 
And you know why they're there? They're God's judgment. You, you, you know why the whole earth ain't that way? Just because of the goodness of God. And, and every once in a while, and I don't know why they did it this way, there would be these huge circles, not, not, not clock maps, but just, just huge circles of green out of nowhere. And that's where they were piping the water in. And I began to look for them, and it was such a stark contrast between the desert and the green. And you know why? That's the goodness of our God. That, that, that's what makes the difference. So he says, when you see all these things, when you see the desolations, when you see the problems, look for me. Look for me in God's judgment. Look for me in God's goodness. Look for me. He made the dwarfs to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. Now, how are you going to know He's a refuge? Be still a minute. Just be still. But you know what? We're taught to do everything and rush, rush, rush and get her all done and move, move, move. And you know what I have found? Sometimes it's way into the end of the day before I'm even sitting still. And you know, at work, I, I would say probably half my job is sitting doing this. But even then, you're not still. You see what I'm saying? Even then, you're engaged on the computer and you're looking at this patient wondering what would be best for me. And you're typing all this information in and you're looking over here. And you know what? Just never an opportunity for stillness. Your ladies, the same way, by the time you clean the house and take care of the kids and get everything in order, husband is coming home again and you've not had time to be still. We need that. You know why we miss God in most situations? It's because we're not still. We have to think, you know, okay, my house burned up. How is God in this? Most of y'all don't know this. Jerry had a house burned to the ground. Did you find God in it? See, that would be hard. And I don't, I don't even know if, if the oldest, I don't even know if Emma was born or if she was from very, very little. Uh, just a teenage couple started out, lose their house, everything they owned, first thing. Was God in it? Yes, He was. The question is, did you find Him in it? Did you find Him in it? Because most of us really don't take the time and, and we have a reactionary spirit. The other day, uh, we were testing this alarm system at work. And, and uh, there's an alarm if a patient who's prone to wandering gets too close to a door. And I didn't know that they were doing it. And uh, uh, they were really seeing if the, people, the staff was going to come from the clinical floor. And as soon as I heard that alarm, I ran. Because that's how I've been trained to do. See, uh, that's how the devil wants you. Don't go to God. Go to everything else. When you hear the alarm move, and don't think about it. Don't think about what's involved. And, and so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know God in a special way if this is to be true. Verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Have you ever, have you ever thought how stupid CNN news is? Yeah. You know what they're doing in all their stupidity? They're exalting God. <laughs> he will be exalted in every event and every situation. He will be exalted. If it is making the heathen look stupid, so be it. He's being exalted in some way. Verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. See him. So I ask you this, are you spending time in the refuge? Now I have a friend at work, he, he is a doctor, in, a doctor in psychology, he's a good guy, Dr. Johnson, and, and we talk a lot, and uh, one day he was talking, he says, there are much deer on your place, I says, I got more deer than I know what to do with it. 
And I said, uh, you could literally sit on my front porch and kill a deer. When deer season opened up, they're gone. You can't find them nowhere. You know what? Them deers have more sense than we do. You know where they're at? They're headed for the refuge. When the threat becomes real, they go to the refuge. You know what? Even in the, uh, you can see hundreds of deer down here at Cross Creek, and there's not one thing you can do about it because the season's never opened. So why don't we go? What, what, why don't we go to a place where the season's never opened? And I tell you why is because we like the world. We enjoy what the world has to offer. Now I want to read very quickly. And the Gospel of Luke, and I think I read this in your hearing recently, or it may have been over at Faith Church, I don't, I don't remember. Luke chapter 5. Luke 5 in verse 8. Luke chapter 5 in verse 8, the Bible says this, When Simon Peter saw it, meaning the draw of fishes, and his first realization that Jesus was a little something different. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he, for he was astonished, and all that were with them at the draw of the fishes which were taken. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, uh, that Peter saw Jesus for something different. Now, let me say this. He did not yet see Him as the Christ. He did not yet see Him as the refuge. But He saw Him as something above the typical. You know, uh, you, you know before the Lord saves you, you'll see Christ in a different way. And I want you to see, and, and, and this, this is the revealing that the Lord was starting to deal with Peter. He saw Himself in a different way. You know what? You, know, you will never ever be saved until you realize you need it. That the revealing of a sinful nature always preludes salvation because see, you don't know that you need it until you realize how ungodly you really are. And, and, and so we find that, that Peter has this revelation that Christ is something above normal and He's something that's sickening and, and, and filthy in Jesus' sight. Now go with me back to the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Matthew 16. Uh, Matthew 16 and verse 13. Matthew 16 and verse 13. And Simon Peter answered and said, uh, well, let's go to verse 13, excuse me. 16, 13. And when Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, there are men today that say, that say a whole lot about Christ. A lot of people today say He never even existed. A lot of people will say, yes, He existed, but He was not the Son of God. A lot of people will say, yes, He existed, but He was nothing more than a Jewish prophet. You know, that's what most Jews say. So, so they minimize who He is. You know, the fact that what, what people were saying about Jesus then and what people are saying about Jesus now really is an immaterial thing. I ask you, whom do ye say that He is? That, that's what He asked Peter, was it not? Because some said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah, risen from the dead. And then He says, but whom do ye say I am, Peter? Whom do you think I am? And somewhere in that long interim, as much as two years since he said, uh, uh, since, he, since he realized his own sinfulness, he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's a refuge. That's a place to go. And he said, Blessed are thou, Simon Verjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. You know, that's still how people are saved today. Yeah. People, people can add their little sinner's prayer and all the stupidity that goes with it. But this is the thing. Without a revealing, you're still lost. 
if He's never manifested Himself to you, what you stand in need of is a Savior. And, and so Peter certainly understood this and, and began to see Christ for exactly who He was. He saw Christ as a refuge. You know what? I, I've heard it said that uh, <laughs> if, if I go to hell, I'll go to hell trusting in Christ. And you know, people like that, they know about a refuge. Now, the only thing that's different is I know I am in hell. And it's not because of my merit. It's because I know the very living Son of God. Uh, uh, Garner Smith used to say, I, I trust Christ so much I'd swing across hell on a dry corn stick. And you know what? I'm right there with you. You know why? Because He's a refuge. When the world begins to needle you and to gig you and to say this is okay and that's okay, you know what? Go to your refuge. That's what He's there for. Now, we can't leave Christ in the sense of salvation, but we can leave His protection. We really can. When we're outside the will of God, um, there, there's no protection there. Go with the Gospel of Luke. And, and this one all, always <laughs> kind of fools people up. But I, I, I love to read this verse. The Gospel of Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. The Gospel of Luke chapter 22 and verse 31. Luke 22 verse 31. The Bible says this. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon... Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. And I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, I want you to notice a number of things. Number one, Peter was saved. Peter was saved at least on or before Matthew 16, right? Because he understood who Christ was. And here we find, uh, on the day prior to the crucifixion, years later, probably at least 18 months to two years later, he says, Peter, Satan have tried, has desired to sift you as wheat. You know what that sifting means? It means getting the jacket off so you can get to the meat. You know what? You know what Christ wants to do? He want, uh, You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to sift you as wheat. He wants to get the jacket Get, in, get that hole off and stomp the meat to death. That's Satan's idea for you. Yeah. And notice what the Lord says. I have prayed for, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Now I want to give you two ideas on that. First of all, he did not pray that he'd be relieved from it. You know what? You're going to go through some hardships. He didn't, he didn't care. Not that he didn't care. He wasn't an in, interested in Peter being excused from it. And he said, I pray thee that thy faith fail not. Now, try this one on precise. The Lord God did not honor Jesus' prayer in that way. But you know what? He fell miserably. I know not the man. His faith failed. And you know what? Your faith is going to fail too. You're going to have days where you're unidentifiable as a believer. You're going to have problems all along the way. And then he says this, But when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Now, conversion can't be salvation because he's already saved, right? When you're changed, Peter, strengthen the brethren. You know, uh, Peter got converted. <laughs> he quit being scared. You know why he denied Christ? Because he was fearful. He thought he was going to die, did he not? That's what needed to be changed. That's what needed to be converted. It wasn't the fact that he needed salvation. He needed to be converted. And you know what? All along your Christian walk, there are going to be times when you need to be converted. And you know who the converter is? It's the Lord God Almighty. And you know how He accomplishes it? Just like He did with Peter. 
throw you right in the midst of the mess. And He'll convert you. He, he, he'll make your attitude change. He'll, make, he, he'll align your beliefs more, in line, more truly in line with this Word. He will do great things in your life. Now go with me to Acts chapter 2 in the very first verse. And we're going we're gonna to look at the converted Peter very, very quickly. Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost fully comes. Now let me say this concerning Pentecost, that it was an annual feast. Fifty days after the Passover, then was the day of Pentecost, and they had another feast. It happened every year. You can follow the ministry of Paul. He went up to Jerusalem for the, for the day of Pentecost. Number one, there's a lot of people there that needed to be preached to. Now, uh, me and Donna, especially Donna, her work with the Amish, they have some of the craziest holidays you can think of. And, 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 and I mean, you would think it was just, and it's just, just as natural to them as us drinking a glass of water. Oh, you can't come that day because that's blah, 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 blah. And Donna's like, well, what's that? And so Pentecost was a routine day, a routine holiday, when God showed up. Now, one thing that Peter was lacking was to be energized by the Holy Ghost. And if you will follow the life of all those people, everybody say it happened twice, it happened four separate times. The Holy Ghost came down four separate times. And you know what it does? It always empowers God's people when the Holy Ghost comes down. Now you remember this concerning the Holy Ghost. He'll never, ever, ever put His approval on sin. So as long as there's sin in your life, sin in the life of the church, you know what? He's not coming. He's just not coming. And, and, and so we find then that He was very much empowered. He was with that group. He was the pastor. And, and He was greatly empowered on the day of Pentecost. Drop down to verse 18. And... And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days my spirit, capital S spirit, and they shall prophesy. They shall tell of the gospel. They shall tell the gospel story. You know, uh, a lot of people want to make women out of pre, uh, make women into preachers, but that's not what it said. When you prophesy, that's not simply a preaching ministry. Prophesying is sharing the name of Christ. Yeah. And he said, "I want the women to do it too." Uh, I'm trying to think of the man. I think it's in Acts chapter 26. The Bible says this. He had four daughters whom did prophesy. You know what they were doing? They were telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Peter was here for this event. Peter was here at this time. Now go with me to chapter, I mean verse 38. And Peter said unto them, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so we find then that Peter uh, is now very bold in the faith, very bold in what he has to say. And, and why? Because he was converted. Because he was in his refuge. Because he was in his safe place. Now, you know, everybody thinks a safe place is a physical location. It is not. It is your relationship with God. Now, this is crazy to me because, I mean, I went to college 25 plus years ago. Now, in colleges, they have the safe area. How stupid. You know what? When somebody tried to rag me a little bit, I'd, I'd get in their face and say, leave me alone. Because you know what? Nobody else is going to do it for me, right? But they have safe areas. You know what I think? I think they need to man up. Right? Your safe area is not a place like the Cross Creek Reservoir. Your safe place is Christ. And you need to be in it. And just because you're saved does not mean you have a refuge. Because you may be living out there. You know, 49 Highway goes right beside the refuge, does it not? And all those curves down with that poor car along. 
But you know what? 49 is not in the refuge. It's outside the refuge. If you can get you a deer on the, on the west side of 49, you're safe. He can be running toward the refuge, but if you get him before he gets there, he's yours. Because he's not in the refuge. Your refuge is Christ. And we spend the bulk majority, I'm afraid, outside His will. And because we do, we're outside the refuge. We're outside where He would have us to be. Acts chapter 4 and verse 10. The Bible says, this is Peter preaching, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before you hold. This is the stone which was set at naught of, uh, of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, I want you to see the comparison when Peter was not, was not in the refuge and when he was. Because when he was not in the refuge, he said, I don't even know the man. And when he was in the refuge, he spoke the name of Christ. Now, many years later, Peter would give his life. But you know what? He was still in the refuge, was he not? When Paul wrote to young Timothy, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand, he was still in the refuge. He was still exactly where he needed to be. What about you this morning? Where are you at? 